Hello everyone, I'm Lothar from G2, you may know me from the smashes like Hearthstone and Fortnite and now we're gonna be talking about TFT and his item tier list, we're gonna do a small short guide for it, I mean probably not short, but we'll see how it goes. Here we have the tier list that I made a few minutes ago, uh, those are the combined items, they do not uh, include the main items that you can find in the carousel or from the waves of mobs that you find in the game. But in general, there's a consensus that items with attack speed are the main reason why you play this game even. So, let's get to the job. On tier S, let's start with the best items. Uh, you can see Rageblade. The Rageblade, why is it so powerful? Why is it so important to have attack speed and mana generation in, you, in the game? Because every single character, well, almost every single character, has a mana bar that if it gets filled... It casts the spell slash ultimate, which is the most powerful ability of that unit. Since the mana generation in this game is directly connected to attack speed, attack speed not only gives you more damage because you attack more often, but it also gives you more mana generation, which provides you more ultimates, which ultimately gives, gives you even more damage in general or utility. So Rageblade, which is combined from the recurve bow, and from the needlessly uh, large rod, is the most sought item for, which makes it tier S, and also it's very hard to combine because everyone is looking for those parts. So whenever you start the game, you will see most likely almost every single player going for a recurve bow or needlessly large rod. And this is why the Rage Blade is on the first place on the list. On the second place on the list, oh, and by the way, Rage Blade actually works with almost every single character in the game. But it's specifically good for carries like Vayne, Draven. I mean, Vayne is kind of bad. But Draven, let's say, who is tier S, is insane with it. Yasuo is insane with it. Everyone who can deal damage and needs mana is fantastic with Rageblade. Characters like Brand, an example. Like, if you play League of Legends, forget what you know about the game. Because those items here, they work a little bit differently. And the mechanics are different. So you need to forget what you know and put different items on characters that you probably wouldn't use it on. So let's say a brand, a caster, would really benefit a Rageblade uh, from a Rageblade and Spear of Shojin at the same time, an example, which we'll talk about in a second. All right, let's jump to the Spear of Shojin. Spear of Shojin, what does, what does it do? It grants you 15... All right, because we didn't say what Rageblade is doing. Rageblade is actually... Let's get back to Rageblade for a second. Rageblade is stacking 3% attack speed infinitely with every single attack now okay let's go to the spear of shojin spear of shojin what does it do spear of shojin grants 15 percent mana with every attack that you do after you first did cast the ultimate from that character now a side word right now spear of shojin is bugged and it still gives a pre-nerf amount of mana which is 20 percent instead of 15 so it's even more powerful than it was before, but even with only 15% of mana, it will be insanely powerful. Now, how do you do this? You want to use the Spear of Shojin on hungry, mana-hungry characters, because not every single character has the same mana bar. Some characters have bigger mana bar than others. Like an example, Akali uh, has 25 mana bar, while Brand has 150 mana bar. You know, while Kart was an example, recently just got changed from 100 to 85. That means the less mana the character has in its mana bar, the better. Because you will cast your ultimate faster, right? With Spear of Shojin, it doesn't grant you a specific amount of mana, but it gives 15% or 20, which makes it very useful for mana-hungry characters, like an example, Brand. Brand with... Rageblade and Spear of Shojin will make his ultimates way faster. Because he grants the attack speed, which gives him mana, he casts the first ultimate, then he gets also additional mana from Spear of Shojin, while gaining still attack speed, so with each attack, he not only gains the mana from the basic attack, but he also gets the magic, uh, sorry, the, the mana from the Spear of Shojin. So Spear of Shojin built uh, from the Tear of the Goddess, and from the BF Sword is my second item that I would say is so useful in the game that it's like impractical to not build it in almost every single game. Because you, 
Every single composition is about ultimates. I would say that Spear of Children is one of the best items in the game that you require uh, are required to have. Next item on the job. Oh, right. By the way, when it comes to mana, one side note. When it comes to mana, it's very important to know that if your character starts the battle with full mana, he will cast his ultimate immediately. So an example, characters like Akali, which has 25 mana, if you give her items that give her from the start more than 25 or just 25, she will start the battle with casting her ultimate and being zero mana. Because you can do an example, two tier of the goddess on her, and then suddenly she starts with 40, she casts her ultimate without hitting anyone and she starts from zero. But if if someone has Spear of Strojan, then he immediately casts, uh, immediately get, gains mana from every single attack and also from Spear of Strojan. But that's a side note. That's a side note. Now let's talk about Phantom Dancer. Why is it so good? What does it do? Phantom Dancer is a build from Recurve Bow and from the Chainmail. Uh, which makes it a little bit tough to do because it requires a recurve bow. And as we know, recurve bow is the most sought item. And by the way, that's my kiddo. Um, so Phantom Dancer makes your opponent miss with every single critical hit. Critical hits, you have 20% chance to hit a critical. But how it works in League of Legends and in Teamfight Tactics is that if you don't get a critical hit in your auto attack, that attack, the next attack has a slightly higher chance than the previous one, and it gets stacked. So, in general, it feels like you're hitting way more often than 20%, which gives Phantom Dancer a very powerful uh, survivability uh, option, because you basically deny so much damage. And denying damage is way better than healing, because it can't be countered, unless someone has Rapid Fire Cannon, but we'll get to that. So basically, Phantom Dancer allows you to dodge so many hits, and you're only vulnerable to magic, so characters like Yordle, as an example, can be almost, let's say, invulnerable. Because you can put a Phantom Dancer, which makes your opponent miss his critical shots, you can put Magic Resist, so it can't be killed by magic, and it has the Yordle trait, which makes your opponent miss attacks in general. So it's very tough to deal some damage to your rules. Phantom Dancer is fantastic on almost every single character, but it's definitely the best on tanks, which are focusing, which are being focused by your opponent, and on hyper carries because it it, it gives you attack speed and it gives you more survival uh, survival uh, skills for that character that needs to cast his ultimates or needs to just deal the damage with his normal attacks. So Phantom Dancer on Draven, Phantom Dancer on, on an example, Brand on Asol. Uh, those are all fantastic uh, targets. And of course, like, let's say, Cannon, because he's a Yordle, uh, or Vagar, if you have him on level 3, Phantom Dancer gives him a lot of time to actually cast his ultimates and kill a lot of um, other champions. Now, next one online, uh, the Swordbreaker, is I think my favorite item personally. It gives you something that a lot of people, I think, under underestimate. It's the ability to disarm someone. So whenever you auto-attack with this item equipped, you have 20% chance to disarm a character for 2 seconds. Disarm is the ultimate stun. Because your opponent will get like a small icon of a broken sword. It's red. It's not that easy to see, but if you pay attention, you'll see it on the in the game. And that character for 2 seconds can't attack and can't cast ultimates and can't move he's basically incapacitated incapacitated never mind he's not able to do anything so disarm is especially good on characters that um apply on hit effects on long range and on many characters as possible so let's say tristana I mean, everyone in um, everyone in the game that has a gunslinger trait is actually fantastic for disarm because you have a chance to hit different characters and disarm different characters. Also, with attack speed, that well, you get more chances to dis disarm someone. You will see a lot of characters that are hopper carries will be able to do like a one v five or one v four or whatever because they will be able to just 
pull out two free opponents out of the game and just be basically 1v1 everyone. Uh, 1v1ing, dueling everyone on the map. So, Desam is also specifically good with Volibear because Volibear with his ultimate is actually applying on-hit effects on many characters at the same time. So, Volibear with attack speed and example and Desam is a great combination. Or even with just Desam, you know? Because Volibear by default has very uh, high HP bar and is also a brawler, so it's easy to get him uh, on very, very, very high HP. So, he's, uh, he's very mm, tanky and will get it to his ultimate most likely, and then he will benefit from this disarm on himself. Disarm, fantastic item, very easy to do, because it requires only um, the chainmail, and it requires the negatron cloak, which is a very low, uh, let's say, tier item itself, uh, but in my opinion, is actually very underrated, because two tier S items require it. And the next one will be Negatron Cloak. Uh, sorry, not Negatron Cloak, but Dragon's Claw. Dragon's Claw is built from two Negatron Cloaks. And why is it so good? Because it gives you 83% magic resist, which, well, basically nullifies any damage coming to you from ultimates. It's one of the most underrated items. Uh, it's definitely an item that you would like to aim for if you know that your final opponents are... Are focusing on magic damage. If you give that item uh, to a hyper carry, it makes it very hard to kill. So, an example, let's say a Draven with Phantom Dance and the Dragon Claw and a Rage Blade will probably be able to survive most of the attacks from your entire opponent team and just sweep everyone. You don't need your hyper carry to have like three items for damage because you need them to survive for long enough to actually de deal that damage. So think about that. Sometimes it's better to go for defensive options on your character that needs to deal damage because the longer he lives, the more damage he deals. Right? The same makes uh, sense with the disarm. This is basically why the tier S list has three defensive items. Phantom Dancer, Swordbreaker, and Dragon's Claw. Dragon's Claw, very underrated, uh, underrated item. The magic resist is nothing to scoff at, and this is why Shivana and Aesol are also so powerful together, because they basically grant themselves a better Dragon Claw just by default. So think about that. Shivana and Aurelion Soul, when they are together in the game, they basically have four item slots, which one is preoccupied with a better Dragon Claw. It's insane. Alright. Uh, now, next item. The last item from Rapid Fire Cannon, uh, sorry, from the Tier S, is the Rapid Fire Cannon. Why is it on the last place in the Tier S? Well, just because of that, uh, because just because of the fact that you have, um, you will need two recurve bows to build it, which is very tough to do, right? Because you require a a recurve bow already for a phantom dancer and for the rage blade, which makes it tough. But it's so worth it. It depends, of course, on your composition. But what does it do? So you need to build it from two bows, and it gives you, of course, attack speed, but it also grants you additional range, and you cannot miss uh, your hits. Uh, we, well, you cannot miss your swings or shots or whatever your character does. So what does this do, and what, why is it so important? First of all, when you attack with a character, there's always a chance of missing an attack. And it's especially important when you play against Yordles, or you play against someone with a Phantom Dancer. Rapid Fire, Canto uh, Rapid Fire Cannon is a hard counter against Yordle builds, and against people who have uh, Phantom Dancers, and it's also great against Shen, because it go bypasses his ultimate. And Shen, by the way, very underrated character, is one of the best, in my opinion, at tanking and protecting your team. The only problem with him is just the very slow casting um, time of the ultimate. But anyway, I, I digress. So Rapid Fire Cannon, the first and biggest upgrade, in my opinion, is, of course, the attack speed, and then the fact that you cannot miss. It's huge. It's really huge. Now, the second thing about the Rapid Fire Cannon is the increased attack range. So when you think about it, you probably your main reasoning 
of using this would be on a, already a ranged character because it, it gives an additional hex of attack, right? So let's say if someone has a range of three hexes, like an example Ari, now we'll have four, and that makes sense, right? Or Draven with, with four hexes will now have five and so on. But it's not exactly that. Melee characters are also gaining range by playing this item, which makes it very important for some characters to be second liners, not front liners, and still getting the maximum bonus. Like an example, Cassidy, uh, with this item, has actually two hexes attack range, which makes it beautiful because you can sit behind a, a tank, behind the tank line, and still attack for maximum damage, burn the mana, gain shield, and be a very, very powerful distraction with just one item. But if you build an example Cassidy with Rapid Fire Cannon, Phantom Dancer, and Dragon Claw, he's almost unkillable. And it's a perfect mid-range uh, mid character. You don't even need him on, tier, uh, on, on gold. You, it's just, it just has to be a Cassidy on silver with those three items. And it's a perfect pivot character because you will sell him in late game and transfer those very powerful items for other characters while still having a very powerful character in the late, uh, early game and mid game so you don't have to spend gold for rolling. It's very important. All right, Rapid Fire Cannon is also bugged. Be reminded that right now what I'm talking about it, there's still a bug with Nidali. When she changes her form, he, she has like four hexes range on her cat form, which is insane. I think Draven also gets um, too big of a buff with it. Because you, you can be in a corner and attack the other corner. So in general, right now, if that's a bug, Rapid Fire Cannon is easily as abusable. Alright, tier S done. Oh my god, this is gonna take a while. Tier A. Tier A is very useful items, but not as powerful as tier S. Because tier S, in my opinion, are essential in the game. Most of the times, you will have at least one or two from tier S. When it comes to tier A, they are most situational, but very powerful. All right, let's start with the Rabbitons Death Cap. It's being built from two needlessly large rods, and it gives you 50% um, buff to AP, which is pretty nice, right? Um, in general, it gives you a lot of just AP damage from your character, and AP damage, bear in mind, if you're a League of Legends player, it's not the same as in your main game. AP increases the damage from every single ultimate Apart from few exceptions, because an example, Volibear, Shivana, they don't gain, they they don't deal magic damage. But in general, most of the ults deal magic damage, and that means that increase in AP will increase the damage from ultimates. So ultimately, it also increases uh, health and gen mana generate, sorry, and shield generation if that ultimate does that. So it's both offensive, defensive um, item that you can use on any character that deals damage or heals. Let's say Brand gets so much more damage with his fireballs. Uh, Asol gets his AoE damage insanely buffed. Varus the same. Uh, so Varus with Rabbit and Death Cap is great. Garen with Rabbit and Death Cap is a great mid-tier pivot character because you can use it um, for maximum damage while selling him later in the late game. Uh, also very important, Blitzcrank is one of the best characters to put Rabbit and Death Cap on him because he starts the game with an ultimate. So essentially, you gain immediate, immediate bonus from the Rabbit and Death Cap from the beginning of the game. Uh, so, let's say you start the game with a Blitzcrank on level 2. It has 450 damage. You put the Rabbit and Death Cap, it suddenly, he, suddenly he deals 700 damage at the beginning of the game to the character he pulls. That's insane. If you combine Blitzcrank with Rabbit and Death Cap, Spear of Shojin, then you gain mana from the first attack you have after the beginning of the game, so you can have Blitzcrank cast more ultimates and ultimate, uh, and ultimately deal even more damage because he's so fast on getting his mana. And, well, you know, just powerful damage. Blitzcrank, very underrated character, also Brawler, which gives him like additional item slots because of the more HP. So, in general, Rabbit and Deathcap, great on every caster, but not only that. And by the way, it doesn't work with Yasuo anymore. Yasuo got changed because that was an easy way of abusing him. Yasuo's shield is not scaling with AP anymore. Yasuo's 
a HP bar only affects the shield. Next one, red buff. Why is it so good and why rank it so high? First of all, red buff, when you hit an auto attack on a character, it applies a debuff, the red buff, which deals 2.5% of the maximum HP on that character every single second for, I think, 5 seconds or, you know, just for the duration when he is attacked, which makes it perfect against tanks, perfect against any HP character, high HP character, but it works on everyone. And it also the most important aspect of all, why is it so important? It denies healing. The character that is hit by a red buff can't be healed at all. And that's the biggest upside of this item. It's also very easy to build because it requires the chainmail and the belt. Very easy to do, very easy to achieve. A great item for either your tank because he, he fights other tanks so he can deal damage um, more consistently or for your carries because they have higher range, uh, longer range and can apply the buff to more characters. In general, I really like uh, red buff to put, um, to put on gunslingers like Tristana or let's say Misfortune or... Well, Gangplank doesn't have range. Graves is pretty good, but we're gonna get to that. But in general, let's talk about maybe Tristana or Lucian. Tristana and Lucian with the Gunslinger have the ability to target multiple characters and also Lucian with his ultimate is able to uh, target different, uh, different champs all the time which applies red buff to multiple characters, which in general gives you more DPS. Now, uh, with range characters, of course, you want to apply it to as many characters as in, as, in, um, as in general, because the Gunslinger trait gives you an additional attack to someone in range. So if you combine an example red buff with Rapid Fire Cannon on a Tristana or a Lucian, he will be able to put the red buff on almost anyone on the map, wherever he is. Now, red buff also is great, especially mid-game when you plan to sell graves later on. Uh, as I said, it's great on graves because it gives you um, the ability to put red buff on three characters with one single blow. Since graves has like this cone attack, it's only one hex away, but it attacks multiple people if possible, and that will allow you to put a, uh, red buff on few people. Now, what I don't like about graves is that he has very slow attack rate, uh, slow attack fire rate. He's only melee range, basically. And that's why I prefer to put red buff on anyone else. I just don't like Graves, you know? All right. Let's talk about a very similar item, which is called Morello. It's, let's call it Morello. So this item basically gives you the same thing as red buff. It got it got nerfed recently because it was dealing 5% of maximum HP instead of the 2.5 now, but it's being applied with spells. So with ultimates, what does that mean? Why, who would you put that on? And also, which items do you require to build it? So you require, for Morellicon, you need the needlessly large rod, which is a very sought item for. This is why I think I'm putting it on A instead of tier S. And a giant belt which is less so sought for. Now, Morellicon is best at units that deal um, AoE damage. Let's say characters like Cartus, Aesol, Varus. Um, well, Varus maybe not as much as Aesol, but Aesol is fantastic with Morellicon. Garen is also fantastic because he applies the Morellicon with his spin around himself, so he can uh, hit multiple characters. It's very powerful mid-game when you know that you most likely will sell Garen when you're moving to the late game. And the other characters that benefit from this would be, an example, Swain. He targets multiple people. Morgana, she targets multiple people. But at the same time, you want to put this on characters that are able to play her, uh, his ultimate as fast as possible. So even on Blitzcrank, this is pretty good because you know you're going to focus that character. So let's say you pull a character like Lulu, you hit her, she gets Morelliconed or red buffed because you can put both on them, on them right? And uh, you deny the healing, you finish that character almost guaranteed. But in general, Morellicon, very powerful item. Remember, it only applies on spells, not on auto attacks like the red buff. Next one, Yumi. Yomi is the first item that we're going to talk about being made out of spatula. 
spatula is a very sought item for because it creates very um very powerful combinations but at the same time some are in my opinion better than others why yumi so high yumi is made out of needlessly large rod and spatula by the way three items out of four in my tier list on tier a have needlessly large rod in it as you can see it's a very powerful now what does y yumi do yumi to a character equipped gives um sorcerer trait and also grants it benefits from it so why is it so important sorcerers get double the mana from auto attacks instead of the normal one the normal quantity so basically that gives you mana this this gives you mana generation although you don't use a mana generation item to combine it with it's important it's very important for every single character that requires mana for ultimates now what is even more important is that it gives you the sorcerer trait to give you the chance of building three sorcerers or six sorcerers which essentially gives you ap bust to every single character in composition since you only required to have three sorcerers for every single character to get 35 percent ap boost with yumi you only are being required to have two right so when you think about it you can have Cassadin which could, can be a semi-tank or a AD carry, you put uh, Yumi on someone else, and then you only need one more mage to have actually AP boost on every single character. I think it's very underrated, because that gives you such a huge and insanely powerful damage boost for your entire team. It's insane. And it's also much easier to build six sorcerers with Yumi, because you don't, you're not being required to have like almost their entire build being focused on sorcerers. All right. Tier B. Tier B are more situational items, but very powerful when they're being used uh, correctly. What is called this uh, This one? I think Ziki's Zekes Herald or something like that. Uh, it's being built from... Uh, from Belt and BF Sword. So two items that are maybe not as sought for, apart from the BF Sword, which is used for Spear of Shojin. And it got recently nerfed, because because before that, it was very powerful, because it, its effect was granting 20% attack speed. Now it grants 10 attack speed, and how it works. You put it on a champion, and every single character that starts the game, starts the fight, next to him, adjacent to that Hex, gets permanently 10% attack speed. Now, 10% attack speed is like two-thirds of a single recurve bow. So when you think about it, you can put like almost six recurve bows on your team comp just by having Zekis. That's insane. That even with the nerfed, with the nerfed value, that is so much, so much attack speed, so much mana generation, that will allow you to cast your ultimates way faster. It benefits, the, it, it greatly benefits uh, team comps that are focusing on hyper carries, um, like, uh, like rangers or blade masters, right? And it also grants uh, more mana for sorcerers, so it's both great for casters and AD carries. In general, I think like people stopped using Zikis after it got nerfed because they thought it's, you know, it got nerfed basically like in half. But it's still very useful, and I think it's very underrated. Next one on the line, another spatula item, the second one. What, my personal favorite. It doesn't do much on its own. It actually doesn't do anything on its own, because it grants the Blade Master trait to a character. It's built from a spatula, and it's built from a recurve bow. So it's not that easy to do, but why is it so powerful? With the Blade Master trait, if you have three Blade Masters on the board you have a 50% chance with every single attack to trigger another attack. What does it do? Creates mana. Deals more damage. It's insane because you only need three Blade Masters to make it work. So you need two Blade Masters to have the uh, end the item to grant yourself another trait. Why is it so powerful? Because one of the best characters in the game are Blade Masters. Draven is a Blade Master. Yasuo is a Blade Master. Atrox is a blade master, and Gangplank is a is a is a blade master. So if you have, um, can't remember the name of the item, but if you have this and you can give blade master trait to someone else, 
he will also benefit from that. It's insane how powerful that is because it gives you um, so much more attacks in general. It gives you more focus on a character that you're trying to aggro. And, uh, well, it gives you more mana because you attack more often. But at the same time, characters that are blade masses are known for dealing shit ton of damage. You know? So think about this one as well. If you give an example blade master trait to a character like Tristana, uh, she will attack because she's a gunslinger. She will attack every single, like, you know, let's say, I don't know, she attacks uh, with Rage Blade and something else, and this, she will attack like three times per second. Every single attack from the Gunslinger uh, from Tristana will have 50% chance to trigger another attack from the Blade Master. But also, every single attack will have a chance from the Gunslinger to trigger another attack on another character. Right? You can actually see that on one of my videos on YouTube when I make a, a Tristana Gunslinger and a Blade Master with maximum traits with four Gunslingers and six Blade Masters. She attacks the entire board like 10 to 15 times per second. It's so fast, she gets bugged, and it's, she deals no damage because it breaks the game. It's very powerful. It's prone to abuse. It just needs to get fixed by the dev so it actually deals damage. Uh, but in general, the Blade Master is easily, as you, uh, easily abusable on characters that you typically wouldn't think of putting that on. Let's say Brand. Uh, Brand with the Blade Master trade becomes a very powerful character because he creates so much mana, so much more, more, more ultimates will be cast, and since Brand has a very short ultimate cast time, right, it, it's almost instant after he gets the mana, he will benefit even more from the auto attacks. Alright, next item. Titanic Hydro. It's one of the, uh, one of the items that I personally don't really use often, but I probably will have to start um, using more often because it's very powerful. Uh, and it's being built from a recurve bow, unfortunately, and a giant belt. What does it do? Every single auto attack from a character wielding the, the Hydra will deal a splash damage on, of 10% of its maximum health. So who do you want to put that on? Most of the time you would like to put that on on a character that has very high basic HP, and let's say high attack speed because you stack that from another another um, item. Characters like Chogat, characters like Volibear, characters like uh, Graves benefit from this the most, Swain as well, uh, because they have very high um, maximum HP, which makes it super duper powerful because they deal so much damage uh, to an area, right? But at the same time, Hydra is amazing on characters that are ranged because you can hit an entire backline with just one hit. So it good, it's good with also Gunslingers because it triggers, um, you know, because Gunslingers trigger on hit effects on additional targets, which triggers then stuff like Hydra, stuff like Red Buff, uh, stuff like Disarm. So if we can combine that, it's absolutely amazing. Um, what else? I think that's all when it comes to this uh, Hydra. It's it's a very powerful, easily easily e easy to use item that you want to just put on the biggest tanks possible with high attack speed. All right, next item, very underrated one. Can't remember the name of it, but it's made from spatula and from tier of the goddess, so it's very easy to do actually, and it grants you the demon trait. Now, why is it that po why is that powerful? Sorry for my kiddo, by the way. Why is that powerful? Demon trait, just yesterday, got a huge buff, but it was useful even before that. Now, let's talk about it a little bit. You have another video on my channel talking about the entire patch that happened yesterday. But, in general, demons are being activated with only two demons. And the demon trait got a buff, so on two demons you need... You, you have 40% chance on every single auto attack to burn the entire mana of an opponent's champ and deal that exact amount of damage of true damage. So it, it denies armor, it denies shields, stuff like that. It just burns the exact amount. It's insanely powerful. Especially in low health characters that are being held with like a lot of mana. Like an example, 
let's say Lulu or Brand or anyone or Leona. Well, Leona might be not, not that much, but anyone that has like 100 to 150 mana bar, but not that much health, every single demon hit takes just so much from him. Now, the thing is, in the previous patch, Virus got buffed to a very playable character, and that makes you um, play a one demon in your uh, in your composition already. Now, if you combine that with this item, you can put easily, you can target a specific characters with the demon trait, because you can use it on a tank, an example, that would deny the ultimates from other people's tanks, while dealing the true damage. It's very powerful. It's an on-hit effect. If you can put it on a gunslinger, it's basically like a disarm or better stun. Sorry, better silence. Uh, because it denies the ability for your opponent to cast the ultimates while dealing damage to them. It's insanely powerful. It's insanely powerful. And you can, I, I would just say that you will see more and more demons being used, especially with this item from now on. All right. Next one. Next one is Force of Nature. It's being built, built from two spatulas. So many people rate this item on tier S. Why do I disagree? Well, first of all, it's being built from two spatulas. And two spatulas can be used to build, an example, a Yumi and a Blade Master or a Demon trait. So you can have even more, even more traits in your board while having less slots, right? And Force of Nature with two spatulas gives you an additional board space for another character. And that feels traditionally, when it comes to outer chess, like a very powerful addition, right? Because you basically get yourself an, an, another level on your character. Now, the thing is, this would work fantastically well in games like Dota Outer Chess, Outer Chess Mobile, um, Dota Underlords, because you have more traditional approach to the game when it's more about the entire army rather than about a hyper carry like it is in TFT. TFT allows you to, have, to be more creative with what you do on the board because items create absolutely broken combinations and abusable stuff that makes the game just feel like every single time a little bit different if you try, you know? So Force of Nature denies you that creativity and allows you to just put one more creature on board. But it's better, in my opinion, it's better to have a smaller team with better characters than a bigger team with more characters. That's like my general rule of thumb of playing in uh, TFT. So Force of Nature, as much as it's very powerful, I would say that I would rather use Spatulas, if I can, for traits for Sorcerer, for Blade Master, for Demon, or even for Glacial that you will see here in Tier C, rather than Force of Nature. So although I put Force of Nature in Tier B, because the natural effect of it is very powerful, I very rarely use it, like very rarely use it, and rather have a lot of other items. All right, let's go to Tier C, the most occupied. We're going to go through this a little bit fast, I would say. All right, this is the Assassin's Dagger, made from a spatula and a BF sword. It grants you... It grants you the assassin trait, which is great because you need three assassins to have this um, this trait being activated, and it activates higher damage on criticals. Uh, and but it also gives something that the item doesn't tell you. You can give that to any character, and suddenly he starts jumping on the beginning of the game, just like any other assassin, right? So you can put that on a tank, and suddenly that tank becomes a backliner for your opponent and smashes your your <laughs> smashes his backliners with your tank. It's not a not the usual sight. It's a, it's good utility, you know. But at the same time, you need to you need to remember that if you put that in example, it's Blitzcrank. He uses his ultimate on someone and then jumps to that guy that he used the ultimate for. So he basically doesn't pull anyone. But at the same time, he gets higher critical attack, uh, critical damage. In general, it's, it's, um, it's a very good item because it, it's easier for you to build six assassins. Uh, so you don't have to go for all assassins. You can just build that on a, on a tank, an example. So it's pretty good. It's pretty good. I just love the, 
love the items that give you the the trait of another class because you can build easily abusable uh item uh item champ combinations uh like Kassadin with assassin is actually pretty good uh because he will disrupt the ultimates from your opponent's backliners which is very important right um and an example draven with assassin suddenly becomes a backline killer an absolute backline killer all right now let's go to the next item which is the static shift static shift is being built from recurve bow and tier of the goddess so two items that you most likely would like to use for something else because tier of the goddess is being used in the spear spear of shodden and the recurve bow is being used in rageblade or phantom dancer or rapid fire cannon so it's not your first item that you want to build but it's very powerful and it's only reason why it's in, in tier c is because it shares so many powerful basic items that are being used for something else other than that if you were to have any other combination i wouldn't put them on b or even a so what does it do with every third attack you give 100 damage to all creatures on board basically i mean most of the time because if they are next to each other they're gonna they're gonna hit by a chain lightning um, by the uh static um static shift now this works the best with characters which have high attack speed or multiple attacks so again gunslingers and blade masters highly benefit from the static shift and the characters with rage blade um phantom dancer rapid fire cannon also benefit from this greatly um recently static shift got unfortunately got nerfed because it was applying morello as well so that was broken but still the pure damage that you deal with this static shift is actually very good. But the only problem that you can see with the static shift is that the longer the fight drags on, the last, the last uh, fights are harder for the static shift because you will have less targets for it. So it's very powerful at the beginning of the fight, less powerful at the end of the fight when you have less characters. Like, let's say you have a 1v1 between your character with a static shift and your opponent has three other items, he has a benefit of having one item that is probably better than the static shift and might win the fight because of that. All right. Now, Frozen Heart. Frozen Heart is being built from Tear of the Goddess and Vest. So it's pretty easy to build. The Tear of the Goddess is used for Spear of Shojin and the Demon Trade, but that's about it, basically, from the very powerful items. Um, and static shift, of course. But it gives something that is like a reverse Zeke Herald. So it's being... Um, what it does it do is that opponents that are being adjacent uh, to this creature wielding uh, the, the Frozen Heart will attack 20% slower than normal. And this stacks. If you have two Frozen Hearts or six Frozen Hearts, they attack really, really, really slowly. Why is it important? It's not about the damage. The damage of the game that you're getting hit by is not really that important. It, of course, decreases it because your opponent attacks less times, but it decreases mana generation for that character, so you basically delay your opponent's cast, casters uh, to, be, to, to play the ultimates, which is very important in general. Who benefits from this the most? I would say assassins, because an assassin jumps to the backline and typically targets, of course, depends on your opponent's um, composition, but typically attacks multiple creatures at the same time or is being focused by multiple creatures. Other characters that are being, um, that are being, um, that, that are benefiting, benefiting from Frozen Heart the most are tanks, your frontliners. If you can put that on a tank, your opponent's tanks can use their ultimates, which is ultimate great because your opponent, an example, has a Chogat or a Nar or let's say, um, Garen as well, with Morello, which is pretty annoying against your tanks. So that denies them that ultimate for a certain amount of time, which may, might be enough for you to kill someone. All right, now let's go. Also, you benefit from, uh, on this, uh, with this item on people that require a lot of time to cast their ultimates. So let's say Katarina, an example, has a 100 mana bar, uh, so she needs to deal a lot of damage to get that to get to that point when she deals the damage with her, with her ultimate. So Frozen Heart helps her survive to that point while slowing down the opponents that she wants to then just slice up with her ultimate. 
All right. Ah, next one. What is the name of that? Ionic Spark? I think so, right? Ionic Spark is being built by Needlessly Large Rod and a Negatron Cloak. So it's like a half-half of importance. Um, because Needlessly Large Rod is being used in Rage Blade, it's being used in um Rabbit and Death Cap, it's being used in Morel, it's being used in Yumi. So it's not that easy to build. But in general, I Ionic Spark is a great uh counter item. So what it does it whenever your opponent deals 200, uh, sorry, whenever your opponent deals, not deals, casts an ultimate, that character is being dealt 200 damage, which is of course being reduced by magic resist, but it's still a lot. It's especially powerful early game when you want to go on a win streak, and you can invest into that because your opponent's uh, characters have less HP, and they still cast their ultimates, so essentially they they like eat one third of their health with, uh, with um, each single ultimate. Um, and it was, uh, in b before, actually, it was triggered with Morello, which made it insane. Uh, but Ionic Spark is definitely great against characters like, an example, um, Draven, Akali, um, Pike, because Pike with Spear of Shodron's O2 casts the ultimates, like, almost every single time, so you put this Ionic Spark on your tank, that has, like, let's say, um, the longest survival time on your team, because then it will maximize the damage out of, output out of Ionic Spark. So, I wouldn't use this item as my main item in the team, but if I see that my opponent builds can be, like, countered by having Ionic Spark, I will think about it. It might be pretty good. Now, next one is Thorn Mail. Thorn Mail is built from two chain mails and a part of course from giving you armor every single character that attacks the, the champ with fall mail gets 35 percent of its damage being reflected to himself now this is an item that you practically don't want to use every single time but if you see that your opponent has hyper carries like draven an example or rangers you can use this to counter them you put that on your biggest, baddest tank. Chogat, like high HP, high armor stats. Leona is fantastic with this one. Leona has the highest armor um, value by default. So with two, with two four males, sorry, with one four male, which is being built from two chain males, she gets to a point where she has very high armor, um, armor value and she can reflect a lot of damage. But at the same time, I think it's the best for actually characters that have high HP, lower armor value to benefit uh, from the vague, uh, from 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 the four mail because you you're not reducing the damage, so more gets reflected back, right? It's 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 a little bit it's a little bit weird interaction, but it generally works uh, works on fantastically on your opponent's carries. Uh, you can use this to kill a Draven before he realizes what is happening. Especially if he doesn't have a Bloodthirster. Alright, next one. The Frozen Mallet. Now, this one is a tricky one. I was wondering if I should put it on the A uh, tier. Um, but unfortunately, it's not as powerful as Yumi. Because it doesn't grant you anything apart from the trait. You know? I mean, sorry. I mean, Yumi gives you the trait as well. But the Glacial trait doesn't give you anything that is passive. Basically, the only thing that Glacier tier, um, Glacier trait gives you is the ability to freeze a creature if you have another Glacier to trigger that, right? Which is be, which is great. You can use that. It's you can think about it like the disarm, but it's being built by a spatula and a giant belt, so it's a little bit easier. But it doesn't give you attack speed. I mean, easier not easier because you need you need a spatula, but in general, giving a um, a frozen mallet to your hyper carries allows them to 1v4 in very clutch situations because he will he will just stun multiple people, you know. Gunslingers benefit from this uh, very much as well. And it's very easy. It's the same thing as with the demon trait. Glacier trait and demon trait is very easy to do and very powerful, which basically denies and deals damage in case on of demon or just denies in case of glacial. And if you, let's say, 
uh, you use Sejuani, which is tier S, right? Sejuani is tier S. If you have a level 2 Sejuani or silver Sejuani, if you may uh, call it like that, uh, you will probably prioritize Glacial Mallet on your ID carry just to have that possibility of stunning people, you know? Um, without having an example, Ash. But if you have Ash and Sejuani, you might also invest into the Glacial Mallet to make your other ID carry or a tank with high attack speed um, stun people. In general, very useful item. Probably just lingering between A, B, or C. Because it depends on your composition so much. Alright. Now, when it comes to Zephyr. I was a very big fan of Zephyr when I started the game. And I thought it's so powerful. And it is. But unfortunately, the longer I play the game, uh, the, longer, the, the more I see the importance of attack speed and deniability throughout the entire game. So Zephyr is a great early fight advantage, but doesn't do anything else uh, after 5 seconds. Alright, let's talk about it, how it's being built. It's being built by a Negatron Cloak and a Giant Belt. And what's the effect? The effect of it is that a, a champion on your opponent's side is being incapacit incapacitated for 5 seconds at the beginning of the round. Which basically means he can't be attacked, he can't be stunned he can't be he can't attack himself he can't cast himself uh for five seconds at the beginning of the game and uh the hex that he's also being uh in the because it creates like a whirlwind effect that hex is also preoccupied so you can't move through it why is it all important uh because you can aim with this zephyr works like in a mirror that means if you put your character in let's say, left side corner, then the opponent in the, uh, in the upper corner of the right side of your opponent will get Zephyr. So if you're in a 1v1 situation and you exactly know who are you playing against, you can aim with the Zephyr the same way you aim with the Blitzcrank to deny your opponent using that character for the first 5 seconds. So I like to use the Zephyr the same way I use the Blitzcrank, if they are not my primary carries, an example, I have a Blitzcrank on my bench, and I put him on the last fight in the last second to pull his AD carry. <coughs> Sorry, to pull his AD carry or someone that is very crucial to his uh, to his composition outside of the battle and just single him out. Zephyr deals deals a similar amount of disruption, but it only happens once at the beginning of the game. Right, but it's still very powerful. It depends on the situation, but I would say it's one of the most powerful items in the game. Uh, and yes, uh, it doesn't work on assassins. If if your opponent only has assassins, Zephyr and Blitzcrank uh, don't work. I mean, Blitzcrank will work after he actually lands an auto attack, then he ults. Uh, but Zephyr just doesn't work at all if your opponent has only assassins. All right, Luden's Echo. Luden's Echo. Uh, is, uh, and yes, Zephyr can be used in the front line as well. Sorry, let's go back a little bit for Zephyr. Zephyr can be used on the front line. Remember, it's always mirror. If you use it on the first row, if you put your character on the first row, it actually works on the first row, right? So remember, remember that. Now, Luden's Echo. Uh, Luden's Echo, uh, is a item being built from, let me check, because I can't remember actually. Ah, where is Luden's Echo? It's Tear of the Goddess and Needlessly Large Lord. So, two items that I would rather use a Rage Blade and a Spear of Shojin. So, it's that, that makes it kind of hard to build. It was fantastic before the nerf because it was applying Morello, uh, which may makes it broken. Uh, but how it works? Whenever your character casts an ultimate, you deal 200 damage as being uh, divided by the amount of your opponents. So it's like a small splash effect, you know? And the only characters that are benefiting from this are characters that are spamming their ults. So an example, Akali. An example, Tristana. An example, uh, Pike. And who else? Anyone with a low, low mana bar, basically. But the problem is, if you cast your ultimate so often, you probably will benefit from Morella more. Um, because it deals true damage, uh, sorry, not true damage, but max, uh, like, percentage damage, and not just 200, you know? 
So the Lunar's Echo, I would say it's it's kind of useful. Like Lucian is also pretty good with it, but I would definitely prefer Morello. It's like a it's like a um, cheap Morello effect, basically. If you can't build Morello, but you can't build Ludens, you can think about it. But Morello is just so much better. All right. Next item, Bloodthirster. Bloodthirster is being built from BF Sword and Negatron Cloak. So it's pretty easy to do, but also it still eats an item from Spear of Shodan. Um, it grants you, if I remember correctly, 35% heal of the attack damage that you do. So the characters that are benefit benefiting from this the most are your typical AD carries. 50%, uh, sorry, yes. Chat is correct. It's 50%. Gunblade has 35. No, 25. Never mind. So, half of the damage the deal, you heal. So, it's pretty good on characters like Draven, which on silver um, rank have actually a lot of HP. Uh, it benefits characters like, an example, Warwick, which has also high damage and high attack speed. Uh, it's uh, good on Vayne level 3, Tristana level 3, and so on. But the problem is, instead of Bloodthirster, I would rather have Disarm or Phantom Dancer or Dragon Claw or combination of those because I think denying damage to get to you is more important than healing because healing can be countered by Red Buff or Morello and that's that's meta. So BT is not as powerful uh, as, um, as that. And also remember, if your character dies in one shot, he cannot heal. So BT is useful but not as useful as Phantom Dancer or Negatron Cloak or Disarm. Because they basically do the same thing without actually healing. Alright, Hexic Gunblade is a little bit better in my opinion uh, than Bloodfester because it applies on more characters, so you can more easily uh, put that on characters, let's say, like Aesol, Katarina, Swain, um, Tristana as well, by the way, because she she deals actually a lot of damage with her bomb, and in general, everyone who deals a lot of damage with his magic, with his ultimate, will benefit from the heal, uh, from the uh, from the Hexa Gunblade, and it's being built from Nilis Large Rod and the Sword, <laughs> and that makes it very hard to build because both of those items belong in those line here, you know. And Hexagon Gunblade is, is a little bit tough to do because of that. But in general, uh, in general, I would say that Hexagon Gunblade is still worse than Phantom Dancer, Disarm, or Dragon's Claw because it heals instead of denying damage. So yeah, basically they're the same item but uh, work a little bit differently. So BT and Hexagon Gunblade, way worse than those three here. All right. Tier D, Seraph's Embrace, I think that's the name. It's being built from two Tier of the Goddess, and it's it's a very weird item. I feel like sometimes it's, it's a buggy a little bit. So what does it do? It, first of all, grants your character 40 mana from the beginning of the fight, because it has two Tier of the Goddess. Each Tier of the Goddess uh, have 20 mana. Not, not percentage. It gives you hard 20 mana so an example if you have a character with 100 mana bar he gets 40 out of 100 but if you have a character with 50 percent with 50 mana bar it gives you 40 out of 50 but if you have 25 mana bar it gives you just full mana bar from the beginning of the game so if you put sarah's embrace on a kalian example she starts the entire fight with her ultimate being cast and then she jumps as an assassin then she auto attacks and she casts another ultimate. Why? Because Seraph's Embrace, after you cast the ultimate, gives you 20 mana. Just like that. So, Akali, which has a 25 mana bar, she casts the first ultimate basically pointlessly because there's no one next to her. But she jumps. She already has 20 mana from the Seraph's Embrace, so she just needs one auto attack to trigger the next ultimate. So it's great for spamming ults for characters with low mana bar. Like an example, Tristana, Akali. It's a little bit more helpful to Pike if he cannot get a Spear of the Shodron or a second Spear of the Shodron. 
you can combine it then with with the Seraph's Embrace. Um, uh, and that's about it. Just check what's the mana bar on your champions. I feel people overlook that. If you right click on your champion, you can see the exact amount of mana that he requires. The bar is all visually the bar is always the same size, but it has different stats. So remember about that. All right. Next one. Next one is Infinity Edge. Why so low? You ask. Oh, I will tell you why. Because it's being built from two BF swords. And a BF sword is used for Spear of Shojin. It's being used on the Blade Master thingy. It's being used on Zika. It's being used on... Um... What else? Uh, Bloodfist and Hexic Gunblade. And it only gives more damage. That's it. Your critical gives 200% damage instead of 100. So if someone has a Phantom Dancer... You are... You are... Really badly. You know? So, uh, yeah. It's an item that I would use in the last resort. I, let's say I have a just lying items around and I see that the game is going to end before I can have the chance to build other items, then I'll probably, um, probably just put those items on the Infinity Edge. But apart, apart from that, I almost never use it. I'd rather have survival, uh, survival items than damage items. All right, next one, Hurricane. Another item that is being overrated highly by a lot of people. Uh, the thing about Hurricane is being built from a recurve bow and a spatula. Uh, no, sorry, from a spatula and a negatron cloak. So it's actually kind of easy to build, right? But you use the spatula. So spatula, I would... Most of the time, I would rather use spatula to find a second spatula to get force of nature. But first and foremost... Synergies with Sorcerer, Blade Master, and Demon are more, much more important for me than just having the Hurricane. Because Hurricane... Hurricane doesn't do anything apart from dealing damage. It splits the attacks, but it doesn't apply on-hit effects. So you won't get Glacial, you won't get Red Buffs, you won't get Disarms, you won't get Silences, you won't get... Uh, mm, anything that applies an on-hit effect with the Hurricane. It, it will heal from Bloodthirster, but that's about it. So two other characters from the... Um, whenever you attack with the Hurricane, two other har characters will be hit by them uh, with the 50% uh, damage value of the initial attack. So it's like a split, basically. It's like a, a little bit different Titan Hydra, but it requires a spatula to being built. So mm, not the best. Uh, I would say if you would like to use uh, Hydra, sorry, if you would like to use the Hurricane on someone, I would say the best character for doing that would be Dra Draven, because Draven hits like a truck, so the damage is actually very high, and the split damage, even though it's only 50% of value, it's still a shit ton, you know? So yeah, Hurricane, not that great. Alright. Um, D. The Hush. The Hush is being built from Negatron Cloak and Tear of the Goddess. So it's pretty easy to do. It's like a soft, soft lock item. It's not hard lock like the Zom. So think about it uh, like it's a, it's a budget the Zom. Because it doesn't allow your opponent to cast ultimates. But if I, if I remember correctly, I think it has higher value than 50% of each attack to silence. So it's actually very reliable. But it only denies um, the ultimates from being cast, not the auto attacks, not the movement. But it's like, if you need something to deny the ultimates and you can't build a disarm um, sword breaker, then build the hush, the silence. But the only reason why is it so low is just because disarm is just so much better. And glacial is just so much better. Like, disarm and glacial are way more powerful than silence. If you don't have any of those, you can think about building silence. Alright, now... On who that works the best? It actually worked good on everyone, but it works the best on people with high attack speed and with multiple targets with unhit effects. So gunslingers and blade masters, basically. Uh, graves with this is actually pretty decent as well. I don't see many people doing that. Okay, tier F. So items that I very rarely use. 
Um, Guardian Angel is being built from the vest, the chainmail, and from the BF sword. So two very sword items for, in my opinion. And the thing is, Guardian Angel revives your character after it dies with 500 HP. So people who benefit from this the most are the ones that have a very low HP bar because it heals them almost the full sometimes, right? It's way more beneficial in early game than late game as well. And uh, we have to remember that when your character gets revived, uh, he's going to be focused most likely because you can't... That's the thing. You don't want to put... Okay, that's a hard thing to explain. Let me, let me, let me try to put it this way. You want to put the Garden Angel on your DPS character so he has like a second chance, right, when he dies... But at the same time, you don't want to put it on a DPS character because it takes a slot. And most of the time, uh, you, you have um, someone to protect your DPS. So someone else will die instead of the DPS. But if you put the GA on a tank, the tank dies the last, right? And then he gets focused by everyone and he can't do really anything. So who would I put the GA on? I would put it on shapeshifters. And why? Uh, because when your character dies, it doesn't lose his mana bar. So let's say a Nar, level 1 Nar, a bronze Nar, has the ability to die with a full mana bar, revive, and instantly cast his ultimate, heal because of the shapeshifters trait, and still be useful. The same applies to Shivana. The same applies to Needly. So, because their shapeshifting abilities have almost instant cast time. So, whenever they have full mana, snap, it happens. So, when GA triggers, you get the ultimate being played right after they're being revived, before anyone can attack them. And that's very important. Another thing when you have to think about it, um, the GA, that's the most useful aspect of it, casting the ultimates. So if you want to put on someone, um, you will put it on someone who has um, a very short cast time on his ultimate. I was testing it out with Shen, in example, and it doesn't work. Shen's ultimate just is, is cast for such a long time, he will die after the revive before he has the ability to play his ultimate. Because I thought to myself, Shen has the ability to deny the attacks with ultimate, as, uh, with his ultimate, so it will be great when he dies, he, he didn't put it off, so then he pulls it off after he gets revived, but unfortunately the cast time is too long I would say it's also decent on some assassins, if they somehow die in the backline mm, because then all people move towards other opponents and they leave the assassin alone, and then he gets revived and just attacks them in the back again so that's pretty decent too uh, alright, Locket Locket is being built by combining a needlessly large rod and the armor. Needlessly large rod, very sought for item, so not really that powerful. And uh, because of what Locket does, it's actually very useful early game, not useful mid game, late game. So, what does it do? It's it's a area effect like Zeke's and Frozen Heart. But what, is, what does it do is that every single character around the creature with Locket gets a shield of value of 200 HP. So when you think about it, that's like a giant belt. And that's it. You give a giant belt to characters around you. So like six characters. So it's not that useful. It's useful early game when opponents don't deal much damage and your characters don't have much HP. It's maybe useful for squishy compositions, like let's say, in example, Sorceress, right? Um, but in general, I would definitely use the items on something else instead than building a locket. Locket is like, I have spare items and there's no chance I'm going to get more items, so I'm going to build something. So yeah, uh, that's about it. Now, Warmog is being built with two giant belts. So basically he grants 400 HP to a character that wears it. 
and heals 3% per second. Which means that a character with 1k HP heals for uh, 90 HP per second, right? Um, so... What I'm talking about? No. 10% from 1k is 100, 3% is 30. So 30 HP. 30, 30 HP per second. Alright, if he has like 3k, then he heals for 90%, 90, um, 90 um, HP per second. Is that much? Not really. Because a single auto attack is that. So basically it denies one auto attack per second. It's not much. And it's uh, easily counterable by red buffs and Morello. And the healing stops working. Like completely shuts down. The only way of making Warmog useful is to have two of them on a Chogat, an example. And then your two item build is being countered by one item. It's not really that useful. It's not really that useful. It's okay, but um, I would definitely use the belts on something else. Something else. Uh, and the creatures that benefit from the most are the ones that have the most HP. So, Grace, Chogat, Volibear, Blitzcrank, um, Rek'Sai... Actually, Rek'Sai might be pretty good with this, because Rek'Sai ultimate makes her untargetable, untargetable, because she hides underneath the map, she heals then, so this is like additional healing, and then she pops out. So actually with Rek'Sai, this might not be bad, but it still wouldn't use it, because it's so easy to counter with the red buff and Morello. Alright, now we go to a very situational tier list, like, you can't really build those, <laughs> unless you're desperate, you know? Um... This one, I uh, can't remember the name, Knight's Vow or something like that, is being from a spatula and a chainmail, it gives you the knight, knight trait, and the knight trait blocks damage incoming from sources, um, so when you have two knights, it decreases 20, uh, from four knights, it decreases 40, from six knights, it decreases 60 or 80, something like that. In general, Knight's trait is very powerful early game, semi-powerful mid game, but it's absolutely pointless late game. Why? Because when someone hits you with 3k crit, like a Draven with 3 items, it doesn't matter if you reduce 80 damage from that, because now he hits you for 2920. You probably will still die from that. So... It's good on auto attacks from normal characters, but from a hyper carry, it doesn't do anything. Alright, now we have Redemption, and Redemption is being built from... Um, what was that? Tier of the Goddess and Belt. Definitely would like to use those items on something else. So, tier, um, Redemption, when the character dies, it triggers a, an effect. On that spot, with like, I think, three hexes range, uh, and after a brief moment of three seconds, it heals your characters in that range for 1k HP. It's like a heal effect that cannot be countered. That's actually an upside of it. So probably it's better than Warmog. <laughs> but in general, it requires your character to die. You want to avoid that at all, all, at all costs. You don't want to have your characters die. So it's more important to deny damage than to heal. So when you want to do that, you don't want to build that. That's about it. Now, the trash bin. Why those two are in the trash bin? This is like an absolute disgrace of items. And if I ever see you do any of those, that means you either don't know the game yet, which is okay, or either you are not very knowledgeable about the game, which is also okay because you can learn, or you're just desperate because you know that you cannot build any other item and you need to do something. All right, so Sword of the Divine. Sword of the Divine is being built from BF Sword and Recurve Bow. BF Sword and Recurve Bow are one of the most important items in the game and you don't want to waste it on the Sword of the Divine and Sword of the Divine does um, that the character wielding it Every single second has a 5% chance to trigger uh, his, his auto-attacks to always be crits. 
for a thing duration of, of 20 seconds or something like that. In general, it sounds like a powerful item, but there are two problems. First of all, it's only 5% per second. So, you have a chance throughout the fight, like in the halftime of the fight, there's a 50% chance that the Sword of Divine triggered at all. There's also a 50% chance that it didn't do shit. So it's basically pointless. Like, the Sword of Divine doesn't do anything apart from its uh, basic items um, stats. So that's one thing. So because of that, you want to put it on a tank. Because, or something that has very high survivability rate. Uh, rate. So, because it needs to, to survive the entire fight and at some point trigger the Sword of Divine. It's a very high roll item. It's very risky, high risk, high reward. But it, it's, it's just pointless when you have to waste such good items on an item that might not work. And also another problem is, with the Sword of Divine, even if it triggers, but someone, someone has Phantom Dancer, which is coincidentally a tier S item, you don't deal any damage. Because every single hit that you do is a miss. So if you want to use Sword of Divine, you need Rapid Fire Cannon, so you don't miss your hits. So basically it's only useful when you have Rapid Fire Cannon, but I still would prefer to have something else than a Sword of Divine. Like any, any item from tier S, A or B, I would prefer that than the Sword of Divine. Alright, and now Scimitar. The Cursed Scimitar, uh, Scimitar, or whatever you call that, is actually funny, because it's actually cursed. Right now it doesn't work, it's bugged. I mean, it does work, but it doesn't work. So what, first of all, what do you require to build that is a recurve bow, yeah, hey, and a negatron cloak. So two items that you'd rather build for something else. And um, how does it work is that there's a very small chance on your attack that will trigger a, a resize of your opponent champ. So basically, if someone has a gold champion, you have a very small chance to make him to silver and then from silver to bronze. So it reduces the stats, which in general is sounds like a very powerful effect, right? But right now, there's a bug that when this is being applied many times to one character because you have high attack speed, your opponent's character is being healed all the time to his full HP. Because if I'm not mistaken, whenever your opponent resizes and it goes up and down, that's, that's not a bug, it shouldn't resize up. It should always resize only down. So when someone is, is already bronze, he shouldn't get she shouldn't get suddenly to silver and then to bronze again, then silver, then bronze again. But it also makes it um I think, if I'm not mistaken, whenever your opponent changes, it takes the percentage value of its HP instead instead of the actual number. So basically your opponent is almost unkillable if you have the scimitar equipped. So don't ever use this item ever, never, never, ever, ever do this item and use it unless or until Riot will fix it. And yes, there's a potential uh, synergy with Vega here. Although I'm not sure about it. Because it, it, it visually doesn't decrease the, the rank. It's only stat-wise. So it might not even work with Vega. That's something that we'll have to check. But after it's fixed. Alright! Wow! That took a while. We are two hours in the stream and I didn't play a single game. And yes, every single item stacks. So you can use two Rage Blades, they're stacking. You can use two Spear Shodrons, they're stacking. Uh, well, Phantom Dance doesn't stack. Alright! Thanks for watching, guys. Till the next video.